The anime begins by showing a place called the Tower of Fongs, the most prestigious sorcerer training institution in all of the Kisalhima continent. That night, a male student named Krylon Silo finds his master, Childman, unconscious. Meanwhile, his adoptive sister, Azili, is seen in great pain after performing a forbidden magic ritual with Childman, which fails. During the horror, Krylon Silo witnessed Azili who suddenly transformed into a giant dragon and tried to escape from the Tower of Fongs. However, the other magicians were already standing guard and immediately attacked the giant dragon. Knowing that the dragon is his sister, Krylon Silo tries to protect her, then the dragon manages to escape from there. Five years later, Krylon Silo decided to leave the Tower of Fongs to find Azalee's whereabouts and changed his name to Orphan. He now lives in a town called Todokanta. One day, Orphan gets into trouble with the twin dwarves, Volcan and Dorton, who are reluctant to return the money they have borrowed from him. Because of that, he beat them up, forcing them to return the money. Not long after, a policewoman arrives to arrest Volcan and Dorton because they are criminals who often commit fraud. Not wanting to be imprisoned, they rushed from there. The policewoman didn't just stand still and threw her stun gun at the twin dwarves. However, her shot missed and hit a male citizen who happened to be passing by. Volcan and Dorton finally managed to escape, while Orphan was forced to help the policewoman to heal the man with his magical powers. Back to the Tower of Fongs, Childman finally wakes up after being in a coma for five years since the magical ritual failure incident that turned Azili into a giant dragon. On the other hand, unable to find Volcan and Dorton, Orphan returned to an inn managed by a man named Bagoop. During his stay in Todokanta, Orphan chose to stay at Bagoop's inn and became good friends with his son, Magic, who desperately wanted to become a great wizard like him. Magic noticed Orphan's dragon emblem and knew it was the emblem of the black magicians from the Tower of Fongs. Because of that, he greatly admired Orphan who had lived and studied magic in the Tower of Fongs. Knowing that Magic's mom was a witch, Orphan told him he might have magical talent like his mother. Orphan didn't mind teaching him about magic, as long as he was willing to pay for it. Not long after, Falcon and Dorton came to see Orphan, offering him a job while telling him they would earn a lot of money after doing the job. The scene then switches and shows the dragon Azali appearing somewhere after disappearing for five years. The magicians who knew of its appearance rushed to attack the dragon, so she was forced to flee from there. But before leaving, she briefly looked at each other with her former master, Childman, who had recovered and led the attack. Elsewhere, Orphan has to disguise himself and play the role of a wealthy merchant's son to attract Maribel's attention, the eldest daughter of the wealthy everlasting noble family. Vulcan and Dorton plan to make her fall in love with Orphan and get them both married. However, because he didn't prepare enough, Orphan became confused when Maribel's mom asked about his family's origins. When Maribel and her mother leave the room, he gets into an argument with Vulcan and Dorton, saying that he disapproves of their plot to deceive the everlasting family and assumes that their lies will be discovered. Not long after, a girl entered the room and introduced herself as Cleom, Maribel's younger sister. She said that Maribel and their mother had known the lies of those who wanted to deceive the everlasting family and had called the police to arrest them. Knowing that Orphan can use magical powers, she also told that several years ago, a black magician from the Tower of Fongs met her late father to leave a sword and asked him to keep and protect the sword. Elsewhere, Childman, who had arrived in Todokanta City with other magicians, was greeted by a young man named Harsha, one of the black sorcerers of the Tower of Fongs. They now served as the secretary at the Witch Association in Todokanta. After that, Azeli also appeared there and attacked the Everlasting Family's residence to retrieve the sword. Cleom, worried about Maribel and her mother's safety, rushed to find them accompanied by Orphan, where he finally reunited with the dragon Azeli after she had disappeared for five years. Azeli, now in the form of a dragon, does not recognize Orphan, her adoptive brother and best friend, so she attacks him and rushes to take the sword she has been looking for. When she was about to leave, the black sorcerers blocked her, who then launched an attack on her. However, Orphan again protected Azeli and fought the witches, so she managed to escape from there. The scene then switches to the past where Orphan still lived in the Tower of Fongs, where the strongest magician studied. At that time, the most talented young wizards, including Azeli, Orphan, and Harsha, were gathered into one class and under Childman's tutelage. Besides the three of them, a young man named Forte met Cleom's father and entrusted the sword to the Everlasting Family. The other students were a girl named Letitia, who was Azeli's cousin, and two young men, Comicone and Corgan. However, the most talented of them were Azeli and Orphan. Before living and studying at the Tower of Fongs, Orphan, Azeli, and Letitia were orphans who grew up in the same orphanage. Because of that, their relationship is very close like siblings. Back to the present, 
Orphan is thrown into prison for trying to deceive the Everlasting family. However, he is finally freed by Harsha who then takes him to meet Childman. After finally meeting Childman, Orphan asked about the ritual he was about to perform, causing Azalea to transform into a dragon. Childman then says that he asked Azali to help him activate the magic power of the Sword of Baltonders. However, the magic of the sword transformed her into a giant dragon. He assumed she must have been in a coma just like him for five years and returned to her senses after five years along with him. He reveals that he had asked Forte to secure the Sword of Baltonders at the Everlasting Family Residence so that no one else would use the sword's power and end up like Azali. Because of that, Azali stole the Sword of Baltonders and hoped to restore herself to how she was with the sword's power. Childman also tells Orphan that Azali is one of the few sorcerers that can harness white magic which can control time and other people's thoughts. He then asks Orphan to help him find her, as he needs a lot of great wizards to overthrow the bloody August. Orphan then asked how they found her. Childman said that he had previously implanted a magic spell on the sword so that they could trace its whereabouts. After packing his things at the inn, Orphan went to the Everlasting Family Residence and repaired the damage caused by Azali with his magic power. As an expression of gratitude for Orphan repairing her house, Cleum gave him a ring saying that the ring was handed over to her family, along with Baltander's sword. Orphan immediately realized that the ring was the magic ring that belonged to Azali that had been shown to him. At that time, she told him the ring could protect the wearer from disaster. After that, Orphan met Childman and joined the Black Sorcerers on a mission to find Azali's whereabouts. Besides Harsha, he met his former classmate, Comicone, who was on the mission. Childman also asks a white sorcerer for help to deal with Azalee who is quite talented in using the white magic. Orphan joined the mission, wanting to save Azalee from Childman and the black sorcerers who intended to kill her. After that, Childman and his party members entered the forest, suspected of being her hideout. Meanwhile, Cleon, who had released Vulcan and Dorton from prison, decided to take back the Sword of Baltonders and followed Orphan into the middle of the forest accompanied by them. However, on the way, they were confronted by a beast. Orphan, realizing Azalee's existence, separated himself from the group and tried to find her first. Not long after, Orphan finally found her whereabouts, but the dragon attacked him indiscriminately. He tried to block the attack because he didn't want to counter Azalee's attack and hurt her. However, Orphan could no longer withstand the attack and ended up blowing quite a distance away. Childman and his party members finally arrived and immediately launched an attack on Azalee while Comicone tried to heal Orphan. When they attack her simultaneously, the white sorcerer attempts to seal her with his white magic. However, as the giant dragon, Azalee became much more powerful so that she could easily defeat the white sorcerer who eventually died. Orphan, who saw the existence of the Sword of Baltonders, took the sword and rushed to run away from the fight. Childman, who knows this, then orders Harsha to go after him. At the same time, Comicon must fall and die after Azalee's dragon shoots fire at him. Harsha blamed Orphan for Comicon's death because his friend had died. They then engaged in a fierce battle until finally, Cleom arrived and managed to knock Harsha down by hitting him. Cleom and the twin dwarves then asked Orphan to help defeat the beast chasing them. With his magic power, he managed to defeat the beast. Orphan and Harsha rush back to the battlefield and find that the black sorcerers have died, and only Childman is alive and is fighting to the death against the dragon. They immediately help their master against Azali. Orphan then realizes that Azalee's dragon has great abilities like Childman who is predicted to be one of the strongest magicians in the kingdom. However, when Childman was about to launch a fatal attack on the dragon, Orphan did not stay silent and protected her. Knowing that Orphan will only interfere with his mission, Childman then stabs him while saying that he will heal Orphan after defeating the dragon. Ultimately, he destroyed the dragon's body with his magic power. After Childman healed him, Orphan rushed over to the dragon's severed head. Vaguely, he could still hear the dragon's last words about regret and saving someone. The next day, he meets Childman and reveals that the dragon killed last night was not Azali but Childman. Hearing that, Azali, who was in Childman's body, was very surprised because Orphan had known everything. She turns out to have exchanged her soul with Childman when they look at each other for the first time after five years in a coma. She decided to switch bodies with him to make it easier for him to find the Sword of Baltenders. Childman, who regretted his actions, didn't seem to mind swapping bodies with her especially after she used white magic to control her mind. Orphan was very disappointed in Azali who had the heart to kill their master, so they got into a fight. However, her attack didn't work on him because previously, he had swallowed her magic ring that could protect him from any attack, even though the ring's power could only be used once. In the end, he decided to let her live and hoped she would regret her actions. After that, Orphan decided to go somewhere by using a horse carriage. However, unexpectedly, Cleom and Magic sneaked into the horse carriage and said they wanted to go with him. 
Playam said that she wanted to go on adventures and visit many places because all her life, she had only lived in Todokanta. Meanwhile, Majik demands Orphan's promise that he wants to teach him about magic, so he decides to follow him. At first, Orphan did not agree with the presence of the two of them. However, after Majik promised to pay Orphan if he was willing to teach him and Clayam promised to be a chef to make delicious food for them during the trip, he finally accepted them as his companions. He turned out to be heading to the city of Tafram where the Tower of Fongs is located. Sometime later, Orphan and his companions had traveled for two weeks, and Majik had mastered magic, which he instead used for unimportant things. Because of that, Orphan then scolded him. However, he did not deny that Majik is quite talented as he has mastered some magic in two weeks. Yet, Orphan took at least three years to master it. After that, they continued on their way, and Orphan told them they would be in Tafram in three weeks. Seeing a ranger post at the end of the road, Orphan steered his horse carriage away from the main road to avoid the rangers associated with the Kimluck Church. He explained that the Kimluck Church is a religious organization with enormous influence, even on par with the royal family. However, the Kimluck Church had a grudge against witches, so it would be difficult for them if the church found out about them and discovered Orphan's identity as the Black Sorcerer. That night, Orphan and his companions decided to spend the night in the forest. Majik, in charge of looking for food, accidentally encounters a giant snake about to eat him. However, Majik manages to get rid of the giant snake with his magic power. Unexpectedly, a girl who happened to be there noticed his action using magic power just now. She then asked him if he was a magician and what were he doing in the forest alone at night. He innocently told her that he was looking for food for his master. She then introduced herself as Fianna and told Majik she was from a village called Sacred Heart in the middle of the forest. Majik then asked Fianna to take him to her village so he could get some food, but she refused because she thought it would be dangerous for him who could use magic power. Not long after, a group of men from the Sacred Heart village arrived. They immediately confronted them by saying that anyone who entered the forest without permission, especially magicians, would have to be punished. Fianna tried to protect Majik by saying he was just a student and the magician was her teacher. However, the man named Mac Dougal, the village leader didn't seem to care and fired his gun at Majik, causing him to collapse unconscious. On the other hand, Orphan and Clayam also faced attacks from the other Sacred Heart villagers. But he defeated them with magic power and rushed to find Majik's whereabouts with Clayam. <laughs> Meanwhile, Vulcan and Dorton are held captive by the villagers in the Sacred Heart village because they are trying to sell a strange jar. Not only that, but Vulcan also told them that a witch was hiding in the forest, so the villagers thought that they were the witch's spies. Not long after, Orphan and Clayam finally arrived near the border of the Sacred Heart village, where Orphan saw a flag with the crest of a wolf residing in the village. He then told her that the wolf on the flag represented a magical creature called the Deep Dragon. He concluded that the villagers worshipped the Deep Dragon, known to hate human magicians. He explained that in ancient times, there was no magic in this world. However, one time, six brilliant beast races had managed to steal the magic used by the gods. The six beast races came to be known as dragons, and the smartest among them was the weird dragon named Norpnir. Since the dragons are celestial beings who cannot reproduce, Norpnir then teaches his magic to humans. However, this only angered the other dragons and ordered the humans who worshipped them to hunt down other humans with magical powers. In the present, when many celestial beings have become extinct, the influence of the dragons is no longer what it used to be. However, there were still a handful of people who secretly formed groups to worship them like the villagers of the Sacred Heart. Soon after, a large wolf appeared, a deep dragon named Fenrir. Seeing this, Orphan told Cleon to go to the ranger post and report what happened in the village to them while he would try to find Majik's whereabouts. However, shortly after Cleon left, Orphan was intercepted by Mac Dougal and some of the villagers who then launched an attack on him. At first, he managed to escape their attack. However, Fenrir was suddenly standing behind Orphan, and with his magic power, Fenrir could easily bring him down, even if only by telepathy. After Orphan was captured, the villagers gathered to listen to what the Deep Dragon had to say through Fianna. She turned out to be an intermediary because only she had the power to communicate with the Deep Dragon. She then told everyone that the Deep Dragon would eradicate the human magicians in this world. After that, Mac Dougal met Orphan, locked in a holding cell, and asked for his identity. One of the villagers, Salua, arrives there and tells him that Orphan is one of the black sorcerers from the Tower of Fongs, judging by the dragon emblem on his necklace. On the other hand, Fianna brought food to Majik who finally regained consciousness after being unconscious for quite a while. She had also healed him with her magic power. Mac Dougal then went to her and asked her to come with him somewhere. Seeing Fianna, who seemed to want to stay with Majik, Mac Dougal then reminded her that he was the one who had saved her, and because of that, she owed him and had to obey all his orders. 
He uses her because only she can use the Deep Dragon's magic power, which he will later use to find the forest's heart. Magic tries to defend Fiena by saying that she doesn't belong to anyone, so she doesn't have to obey anyone. Hearing this, Mac Dougal then became annoyed and was about to shoot him, but Fiena got in the way, so he decided to leave. Knowing that Mac Dougal was only using Fiena, Magic asked her to come with him to leave the village. However, she refused by saying that she couldn't leave the forest. She then takes him to meet Orphan, who is locked up in a holding cell, where Orphan seems unable to move his body after being mentally attacked by the Deep Dragon. However, Orphan realized that Fiena had healed him, so he thanked her. But then, Salua arrived there and then knocked down Magic. Salua knows Orphan is from the Tower of Fongs, calls him by his real name, Krylon Silo, and tries to kill him. However, Orphan finally managed to move his body, got up, and dodged Salua's attack. Salua then took out a glass sword which Orphan immediately recognized as a rare sword that only a few existed in the entire continent. He is an assassin from the Kimluk Church, usually referred to as the Death Instructor. However, just as they were about to start the fight, Cleom arrived there and hit Salua on the head until he fainted. Orphan asked Cleom to leave, but she refused because she thought he just wanted to get rid of her. He also openly said that she would only be a burden because she couldn't use magic or have fighting abilities, so it would be safer for her to leave immediately. Because Cleom didn't want to obey Orphan, Fianna was forced to use her power to control Cleom's mind so that she would leave. Fiena then asked Orphan to take Magic and Salua out of the village. Even though Salua was a murderer, he was the only person who treated Fiena very well, so she was indebted to him and didn't want him to get hurt. Fiena had found out that Salua was the death instructor of the Kimluk Church after reading his mind. She also knew that his mission in coming to this village was to kill Mac Dougal, who used to be the death instructor of the Kimluk Church, just like him. However, she did not know what goal Mac Dougal wanted to achieve by worshipping the Deep Dragon. Because of that, she would still go on to search the heart of this forest with Mac Dougal, hoping to find out what he was doing. Orphan, who heard Fiena's words, tried to stop her because it could endanger her life. However, she seemed to have accepted the consequences and would face them at any cost. He then said he would help her and would not let her die just like that. He then took Salua's glass sword and forced him to bring it to Mac Dougal. Arriving there, Orphan asked Mac Dougal to free Fiena while telling him that Salua was an envoy of the Kimluk Church and was ordered to kill him. Hearing this, Salua then attacked Orphan for revealing his identity. However, he can easily take down Salua and Mac Dougal, who try to shoot him. Orphan then asked Mac Dougal why he was so obsessed with getting to the forest's heart. Mac Dougal revealed that he wanted magic power that could surpass the dragons. He then tried to shoot Orphan, but the gun instead hurt him fatally. At the end of his life, Mac Dougal told Orphan that he had seen something in the Kimluk Church whose power could destroy the entire continent. However, when Orphan was about to inquire further, Mac Dougal had already died. Elsewhere, Cleom, who was with the rangers in the forest, was surprised by the appearance of a small animal that turned out to be the child of the deep dragon. Because it looked adorable, she then carried the little animal. However, the rangers ran in fear because they thought that the deep dragon must be not far from there. Meanwhile, the villagers who know Mac Dougal has died chase Orphan because they think he has killed their village leader. At the same time, Fiena received a warning from the Deep Dragon to run away from the village because the Deep Dragon will soon destroy the village to punish the villagers, who will continue Mac Dougal's desire to find the forest's heart to obtain magical powers that can surpass the dragons. Orphan finally reunited with Magic during his escape, and they tried to escape using teleportation magic. Even though they could only move about 10 meters away, they managed to avoid the villagers who wanted to catch them. However, not long after, they were surprised by an attack from the Deep Dragon who wanted to destroy the village. At the same time, Cleom arrived at the village carrying the child of the Deep Dragon that she had found in the forest. She then told Orphan that the little animal was the son of the Deep Dragon. Orphan, who was trying to protect the villagers, tried to fight the Deep Dragon, even though his magic power was not commensurate with the Deep Dragon, a celestial being. He then threatened to kill the child of the Deep Dragon if the creature did not stop its attack. However, the Deep Dragon didn't seem to care as she said that she could resurrect the living creatures that had died, just like she had done with Fiena who she found lifeless in the middle of the forest. The Deep Dragon then revived Fiena and gave her a little magic power to become an intermediary who could communicate with her. She sent her to watch Mac Dougal, who was after the magic power from the heart of the forest. Because his threat didn't work, Orphan again prepared to launch an attack on the Deep Dragon. However, again the Deep Dragon could easily take him down with a mental attack through telepathy. Even so, Orphan finally knew the weakness of the Deep Dragon's attack, which was none other than through her eyes. Because of that, he then asked Magic to use his magic power to obscure the Deep Dragon's view, 
so Orphan finally managed to bring down the Celestial Being with his magic power. However, the Deep Dragon only received minor injuries and then bounced back to attack them. But then, Fiena arrives there and asks Deep Dragon not to destroy the village and kill everyone. She even threatened to overthrow the Deep Dragon because she also had her magic power. Hearing this, the Deep Dragon became furious and attacked her until she was knocked down and collapsed in front of Orphan and his companions. Seeing the injured Fiena, Cleon did not just stay silent and asked the child of the Deep Dragon to fight its mother. Unexpectedly, it turned out to have the dragon's magical power which was even capable of destroying the Deep Dragon, which was its own mother. The next day, Orphan and his companions prepared to continue their journey and said goodbye to Fiena and the villagers planning to start a new life elsewhere. After the Deep Dragon died, Cleon decided to adopt the child of the Deep Dragon, which she later named Lakey. Orphan and his companions try to get along with Lakey's presence. Sometime later, they finally arrived at the town of Tafram, and it didn't take long to reach the Tower of Fongs. The scene then switches and shows a man killing one of the black sorcerers from the Tower of Fongs, but as it turned out, the killer man was also a black sorcerer. Meanwhile, in the Tower of Fongs, a commotion was going on because several elderly wizards were found murdered. Because of that, the other elders urged the greatest magicians to investigate the case. Forde then stated that the incident began when Childman and the strongest black sorcerers went on a mission to subdue the dragon Azali, which made the Tower of Fongs lose many of their greatest magicians. Forde then went to his office and met with Letitia, who asked about the dragon Azali they had conquered. However, he was reluctant to answer her question by saying they had much more important and urgent matters. Forde, who had gathered some clues regarding the murder of the mage elders, told her that he had obtained information regarding the traits of the assassin who were very similar to orphans. Forde said Orphan also had a strong reason to kill the wizard elders because he might want to avenge Azali's death. Forde and the black sorcerers didn't seem to know that the dragon that died was Childman, while Azali, who was in his body, had disappeared somewhere. Forde then asked Letitia to help him catch Orphan. Meanwhile, elsewhere, Cleom uses Lakey's power to attack Magic only because he says that her cooking is not delicious. <laughs> Due to the mess they caused, Orphan had to report to the ranger post and apologize. Luckily, the ranger standing guard there did not report him and his companions to the Kimluck church, even though the man knew that Orphan was a magician. However, not long after Orphan left the ranger post, he realized that his necklace had disappeared, and someone had killed the ranger. He also looked surprised because he didn't feel the presence of anyone there besides himself. Orphan later found his necklace hanging along with a written message stuck into the wall with a knife. Soon after, a man attacked Orphan and his companions, destroying his carriage. Magic tried to counterattack, but the attack didn't work on him at all. Even that man could easily take them down at once and switch places using teleportation magic. Orphan then asked Clean not to let her guard down and stay focused on Lakey because right now, Lakey was the strongest among them, and their only hope was to beat the man. Orphan then asked the man's identity because the teleportation magic used by the man was Childman's magic that was only taught to his students in the Tower of Fongs. However, the man did not answer Orphan's question and instead repeated the words he wrote in the previous message. Knowing that the man was the one who had killed the ranger, Orphan became angry and attacked him. Unfortunately, the man could outperform Orphan and bring him down again. Cleom then asked Lakey to attack the man. Yet, that only caught Lakey off guard because he couldn't attack and protect her and Magic at the same time. Because of that, the man then launched a fatal attack on them. Orphan, who did not have time to save his friends, assumed they had died in the attack. But as it turned out, the man's attack missed because Letitia got there just in time to save Magic and Cleon. Letitia then revealed the face of the man who looked much like Orphan when he was still a student at the Tower of Fongs five years ago. Feeling pressed by her presence, the man finally fled from there. After that, Orphan and his companions headed to the city of Tafram with Letitia, who then told about the murder of the wizarding elders that had happened frequently recently. In the Tower of Fongs, the remaining 15 mage elders are meeting to discuss the murder incident against their comrades where the elders suspect that the Kimluck Church is the mastermind behind the murder incident. Meanwhile, Forde is communicating with Harsha through telepathy, where Harsha tells him that he has not been able to locate Childman's whereabouts. Because of that, he then guessed that Childman might have been killed, and the only ones who could do that were Orphan or Azali, the most talented mages among them. Because they suspected that Azali had died, Forde had named Orphan the main suspect. The scene then switches and shows Letitia bringing Orphan and his companions to her house asking them to stay there for a while. While looking through old photos of them when they were little and raised in the same orphanage, 
Orphan saw Letitia who was about to go to the Tower of Fongs to report to Forte that Orphan was not the suspect they were looking for. That night, Orphan plans to tell Letitia about what happened to Azali and Childman. But then, the killer they were looking for suddenly appeared at Letitia's residence, telling Orphan that he had lost his powers long ago. The killer man then introduces himself as Krylon Silo, the ghost from Orphan's past. Hearing that, Orphan also confirmed that the man was not him because Krylon Silo five years ago would not have killed anyone else. However, Krylon Silo said that Orphan did not deserve to be Childman's successor because he could not kill other people. Therefore, the fake Krylon Silo said he was the heir that Childman wanted. After that, the fake Krylon Silo then disappeared from Orphan's presence. However, unbeknownst to both of them, Cleom turned out to be behind Orphan and overheard their conversation. The next day, Cleom tries to find the fake Krylon Silo along with Lakey. On the other hand, Orphan assumed that this was Azalee's doing who sent someone similar to him to spread terror and commit murder. Not long after, Letitia came over to Orphan and introduced two of her students named Tiffies and Patricia. Tiffies and Patricia told Orphan that they had just met two boys who claimed to know him. However, they locked the two in the warehouse because it looked very suspicious. When Orphan meets them there, it turns out that they are the twin dwarves, Volcan and Dorton. He said he would release them if they were willing to do something for him. They were asked to patrol the city. However, they instead met with Cleon. Meanwhile, Letitia tells Orphan that chaos has happened since Childman disappeared. Internal conflicts often occur in the Tower of Fongs. She assumed that many of the black sorcerers wanted to replace Childman as one of the highest ranking mages in the Tower of Fong's leadership ranks, as well as the wizarding associations of the entire continent. They also wanted to get rid of Childman's protégés, one of whom was Forde, who nearly died from being poisoned. Forde is also being targeted because, at this time, he is replacing Childman temporarily. It didn't stop there. The situation became even more chaotic with the appearance of the fake Krylon Silo and also the incident of killing the Witch Elders. Hearing that, Orphan stated that only two people could freely enter and exit the Tower of Fongs without getting caught up in Forde's surveillance technique called the Childman Network, and those two were himself and Childman. Letitia also wondered if Childman was the mastermind behind all this chaos, considering that Orphan had proven himself not the culprit. He witnessed that Childman's soul and Azalea's dragon body had been destroyed and said that Childman was not the culprit because he would never return. Elsewhere, Cleom, who was relaxing with Volcan and Dorton, encountered a group of worshippers of the dragons who happened to be passing by them. Unexpectedly, one of those people is the fake Krylon Silo who then makes Lakey and Cleom unconscious and kidnaps them. Vulcan and Dorton then reported the matter to Magic, who took them to meet Orphan. The dwarves tell him that the fake Krylon Silo took Lakey and Cleom to Childman's house. Magic, who didn't know that Krylon Silo was Orphan's true identity, then asked Letitia who explained that Krylon Silo was one of the talented magicians who was Childman's student. However, Letitia did not reveal that Krylon Silo was Orphan's real name. Orphan, who decided to face the fake Krylon Silo alone, rushed to Childman's house. Meanwhile, Magic, who was forced to stay at Letitia's house to wait for Orphan, is approached by Tiffies who then tells Orphan's past and reveals that his real name is Krylon Silo. Tiffies tells Magic that five years ago, Orphan was chosen as one of the royal wizard candidates and was under Childman's control, one of the strongest wizards of unknown origin. As the most talented of his friends, Orphan was later chosen to be Childman's successor, and he taught Orphan all his skills and techniques in magic. In the end, Orphan was chosen to become a royal mage and prepared to leave the Tower of Fongs to head for the palace. However, the Tower of Fongs, who didn't want to lose one of the greatest magicians, had planned something to get Orphan out of the way as the chosen candidate by having someone attack him. Because he acted recklessly and caused someone to die, Orphan was finally eliminated as a royal mage candidate and decided to leave the Tower of Fongs. After learning about Orphan's past, Magic decides to help the teacher. So did Letitia. Tiffies then warned that their safety would be threatened if they were involved with him. However, she didn't care because he was her most precious little brother to her. She asked Tiffies to respect Orphan. Meanwhile, Orphan finally arrives at Childman's residence and is confronted by the fake Krylon Silo, who indirectly reveals that Azili sent him so that she could regain her lost powers five years ago. However, Azili did not expect the fake Krylon Silo to be selfish causing chaos and ambitions to be the only Krylon Silo for Azali by killing Orphan. The police are already there to arrest them when they get into a fierce fight. But then, Letitia and Magic arrived, revealing that she would take care of everything. During the fight, the fake Krylon Silo reveals that Childman has passed on the ancient magic, killing doll, to Azali. Killing doll is a technique in magic that can turn a doll into a killing machine simply by writing certain spells on the doll's body. The fake Krylon Silo is a killing doll, 
where Azalee then uses the power of the Sword of Baltenders to make her form like Orphan five years ago and has the same power as him at that time. Orphan has a hard time dealing with the fake Krylon Silo because he has the power of the Sword of Baltenders. However, with a strong determination to protect his friends, he finally defeated the fake Krylon Silo and became the only real Krylon Silo. But then, Azili arrived there and appeared in front of Orphan. She then said that she did not know about her killing doll, who had her consciousness and acted as she pleased by killing many innocent people. Yet, Orphan, who had hated her since she killed Childman, didn't necessarily believe her words and challenged her fight with him. However, Azili refuses to fight with Orphan because she realizes she cannot defeat him who is Childman's sole heir. She then reveals that Childman chose Orphan to be his heir because he has the potential to defeat the white sorcerer who is none other than her. Confidently, Azili told Orphan she had a great chance to beat Childman with the white magic she had mastered. Because of that, Childman prepares him and teaches him all skills to Orphan so he can kill her. However, Orphan did not believe Azili's words because, according to him, Childman would have known that he would not be able to kill her who he considered his sister. Orphan then invited Azili to come back and live with him and Letitia. But she refuses, saying that she has a plan to find out what Childman thinks about all this. After that, Azili offered Orphan to join her. But because he refused, she decided to leave and told him she was going to the Kimlock Church. Letitia and Magic finally arrive and find Orphan unconscious, while Azili's whereabouts are unknown. Elsewhere, in the headquarters of the Worshippers of Dragons, a man commits a massacre of Worshippers of the Dragons because he wants a map belonging to the Browning family. However, the man did not find the map there, as one of them told him that it had been handed over to Childman. After that, at Letitia's house, Orphan, who had just left the room, was suddenly attacked by a masked man who also asked about the map belonging to the Browning family. However, the masked man fled after Cleom and Magic arrived to take Orphan to dinner. The next day, Orphan met Letitia and told her he was going to the Tower of Fongs because Magic wanted to become a magician and study magic there. He then tells her that the fake Krylon Silo is a killing doll. But Orphan did not tell that Azili was the one who created the fake Krylon Silo. Letitia then handed him a piece of paper which turned out to be a certificate that she had guaranteed him for five years, in which he was still listed as the official black sorcerer, and left the Tower of Fongs because he had to carry out a mission. That way, Orphan wouldn't lose the high mage rank he had earned as one of Childman's students. On the other hand, Magic is seen reading a book he accidentally found while at Childman's house to help Orphan. He then showed the book to Cleon because it was written in an ancient language that he mostly did not understand. She explains that the book contains magic spells about changing the world order and creating new worlds. In the middle of the conversation, Orphan and Letitia came to them and told Magic to get ready because they were going to the Tower of Fong soon, while Cleon would stay home with Tiffy's and Patricia. On their way to the Tower of Fongs, Orphan and his companions were attacked by the worshippers of the dragons. Since they weren't magicians, Orphan fought them without using magic power, relying only on his physical abilities. Orphan noticed that his strength had increased after defeating the fake Krylon Silo, which meant that Azalee was telling the truth. When he asks why the worshippers of the dragons attacked them, one of the men tells them that they only want revenge because a black sorcerer has massacred their friends. But then, the black sorcerer that the man was referring to arrived and killed the man worshipping the dragons right in front of Orphan. After that, the man introduced himself as Hydrant and admitted that he had known Orphan for a long time. Orphan then attacked Hydrant, but he managed to dodge Orphan's attack with ease. He then informed that he was sent there to escort Letitia and Orphan, who was about to head to the Tower of Fongs. Once there, one of Forday's men, Finby, tells Letitia that she must help with Magic's registration process while Orphan is asked to meet Forday in his office. After meeting with Orphan, Forde asked him where Childman was, but he refuses to tell Forde and keeps the truth of what happened between Childman and Azalea a secret. Forde then tells Orphan that Finn B is a spy for one of the magic masters in the Tower of Fongs named Curley, who wants to take over Childman's power in the Tower of Fongs in the Witch Association. Because of this, he asks Orphan to help him defeat Curley and his minions before they finish off Childman's students, including Orphan. Forde also reveals the lie that Hydrant wrote in the report about the attack incident where Hydrant wrote that Orphan had massacred all the worshippers of the dragons. The truth is, Orphan can take them all down without the need to use magic power. He was very angry because Hydrant had dared to twist the facts. Because of that, he then went to Curlane and said that the Hydrant had killed the worshippers of the dragons. However, Curlane seemed unconcerned as he said that his men found them lifeless. Orphan then warned him not to touch Letitia and Magic, but he countered Orphan's words by warning him not to make him an enemy. In the afternoon, when Orphan and his companions were about to return to Letitia's house, they were surprised to find Cleom lying on the road with a wound on her head. Tiffy's informs them that a masked man attacked her. 
However, the man immediately fled before they could strike back. Patricia said the masked man was wearing a special combat uniform usually worn by the Tower of Fong's black sorcerers. Hearing this, Orphan became reminded of the masked man who had attacked him at Letitia's house some time ago. On the other hand, Letitia apparently couldn't contain her anger over the consecutive attacks, especially now that they dared to attack civilians who didn't have magical powers like the worshippers of the dragons and Cleon. Therefore, Letitia decided to explore the area around her residence to find the masked man's whereabouts so that no one else was injured and ordered Orphan to take Cleom to the house. Arriving at the house, Orphan then healed Cleom with his magic power. After confirming that Cleom had recovered, Orphan asked Magic and Tiffys to look after her while he went to help Letitia. Elsewhere, Letitia finally finds the masked man in an old abandoned building. Unexpectedly, she had to deal with two masked men, who turned out to be Hydrant and one of Curlane's students, a man named Swain. Hydran immediately asked Letitia about the map belonging to the Brownings, as he assumed it was kept by one of Childman's students. Letitia, who didn't know about the map the Hydran was referring to, tried to attack them with her fire magic power. Seeing this, he ordered Swain to cut Letitia's throat so she could not cast magic spells. <laughs> Letitia launched a fatal attack at Swain, but he could withstand the attack without even being injured. He counterattacked and pushed her until finally, Hydrant came forward to slit her throat. However, Letitia managed to free herself from Swain and Hydrant's ambush, although she was seriously injured and lost several of her fingers in the process. When Swain was about to kill Letitia, who was seriously injured, suddenly someone who was also wearing the uniform of the Black Sorcerer appeared, which turned out to be Azalee. She wanted to protect Letitia and prepared to attack Hydrant and Swain. However, the two of them, who knew how tough Azalee was in battle because she could use white magic, decided to run away from there. Not long after, Orphan arrived there and found Letitia unconscious. He immediately brought her to the house and healed her. Letitia, who thought that Orphan was the one who had saved her, then thanked him. But then, she said that she had heard Azalee's voice and thought that maybe she was hallucinating. Hearing this, Orphan felt sure that Azalee had saved Letitia, but he didn't tell her. He then told her that he had succeeded in connecting her fingers to return to normal as before. Yet, he admitted that he was not very gifted with healing magic so that it would leave a permanent scar on her finger. However, Letitia didn't mind it and still thanked Orphan. Because they had dared to hurt those closest to him, Orphan couldn't hold back his patience and was determined to take revenge on Hydrant and the others. However, Letitia prevented Orphan and asked him to contact Forde and tell him everything so that he could report to the wizard elders about Hydrant's action and all of Curlane's students involved in the attack. She hopes that they will receive the appropriate punishment. She then thought of Comicon and said that if he were still alive, he would be able to heal her wound very well without leaving a mark. Letitia told Orphan that after Comicon died, Corgan, one of Comicon's closest friends, suddenly decided to leave the Tower of Fongs for unknown reasons. Letitia then begged Orphan not to leave her because right now, the only remaining Childman students in the Tower of Fongs were her and Forde. That night, in Letitia's yard, Orphan meets Azalee who tells him about the map belonging to the Browning family that Hydrant and the Curlane students are looking for. She said it was not a map but a magic book belonging to the King of Magic named Swadenborg. A long time ago, the people of the Kimluck Church found the magic book, but because the Kimluck Church hates witches so much, they entrusted the book to the Browning family, whose head of the family is one of the top brass in the Kimluck Church. But then, the book changed hands again until it was finally reported to be in Childman's hands. Curlane wanted to get the magic book because it contained the strongest magic spell he would later use to control the Tower of Fongs. Azalee also informed that the book Hydrant and Curlane's students were looking for was now in Magic's hands. Before leaving, she asked Orphan to prepare himself because Hydrant and the others might come to pick up the book. On the other hand, unbeknownst to them, Cleom overheard their conversation. After that, Orphan asked Magic and Cleom to get ready because they were going to the Tower of Fong soon. The three managed to infiltrate there, but the Hydrant found out where they were and attacked Orphan. He tried to attack Orphan with his sword, but Orphan ran away instead leading Hydrant to another place for a one-on-one -on -one duel with him. Hydrant turns out to be the one who was attacked by Orphan to death when he tried to prevent Orphan from becoming a royal wizard five years ago. He doesn't care about the magic book and joins the mission because he wants to take revenge on Orphan, who has injured his face. When they got into a fierce fight, Finn B managed to find the whereabouts of Cleom and then attacked her. However, Lakey did not stay silent and used his power to attack Finn B. On the other hand, Magic had to face Swain, even though he was a novice mage who only learned magic from Orphan, Magic could withstand the attacks of Swain, the Black Sorcerer. But then, Swain managed to snatch the magic book that Magic brought and knocked him down. When Swain was about to kill Magic, Forde arrived and immediately attacked him all out, until finally, Swain decided to run away. 
Elsewhere, Orphan finally manages to take down the Hydrant and intends to kill him for daring to hurt Letitia. However, Cleom arrived there and tried to convince him that he was not a murderer until finally, he let Hydrant live. After that, Orphan and Cleom headed to where Curlane and his students had managed to get the magic book brought by Magic. However, the magic book turned out to be Cleom's diary that Orphan had deliberately altered to trick Curlane's students. Curlane was furious and then ordered his students to kill Orphan. But then, Forte and Magic arrived there to help him. Forte then told Curlane that he and his students were guilty of all their crimes. Forte had forced the Hydrant to confess his actions and admitted it in writing in exchange for the Hydrant being kept alive and leaving the Tower of Fongs. After that, Azalee surprisingly appeared at that place. Curlane, who knows she is still alive, then tries to attack her. However, Orphan didn't just stay silent and used Childman's technique to make Curlane unable to use magic forever. After that, Azalee used her white magic to erase Curlane and his students' memories of her being alive. The anime ends with Curlane and his henchmen being captured by Forte and will be tried for the crimes they have committed. The season 2 begins by showing a group of bandits who are seen planning an attack on a place called the Kamasunda Theater. However, how shocked they were when they found out that they would face a herd of monsters in the theater. Meanwhile, in the forest, Orphan and his companions seem to be arguing over the last piece of meat being grilled, which is their dinner. After leaving the Tower of Fawns, they experience several misfortunes, such as the destroyed horse carriage, the stolen groceries, and all the money they had. As a result of this misfortune, they had a hard time. Even they had to argue with each other over food. Hearing this, Magic then asked his companions to rush to the sound source to find out what really happened. However, Orphan firmly refused his request because they had always had bad luck since leaving the city of Tatakanta three months ago. While Orphan was scolding Magic, they didn't notice that Cleon took the last piece of cooked meat and devoured it immediately. Seeing this, Orphan becomes very angry with her, even intending to attack her using his magic power. When Magic tried to calm him down, they heard another scream, but Orphan insisted on staying there. Cleom said that they might get food if they helped those people. In the middle of the argument, Orphan and his companions heard the screams of a man who seemed to be in trouble getting louder, chose to search him. They finally found the source of the screams, which turned out to be from the Kamasunda Theater, not far from where they were camping. Orphan had no idea there was such a building in the middle of the forest because the building was never written down or mentioned on the map. Not long after, suddenly, a monster appeared and attacked them. However, Orphan could easily take down the monster using his magic power. On the other hand, the bandits seemed to be getting increasingly pressured by the hordes of monsters who continued to launch attacks in a row. A man, one of the bandits, then asked Orphan and his companions to save their leader, a woman named Machin, who was still in the theater building. Realizing they were now surrounded by a pack of monster wolves that were very difficult to defeat, Orphan prepared to use his most powerful magic technique and asked his friends to take cover behind him. And Lakey issued his power to distract the monsters so that they managed to enter the abandoned theater building to save Machin. Arriving inside the building, they found a lot of statues of demons and angels, which are said to be the servants of the demon king Swadenborge. Orphan explained to his friends that the magic of Swadenborge was the only magic not stolen by the dragons, and because of that, Swadenborge considered himself the only god in the world. Meanwhile, outside the theater, Vulcan and Dotkin have been spying on Kamasunda Theater, thinking that there is treasure inside. When the two dwarves were about to head there, Azili suddenly appeared and warned them that the Kamasunda Theater was very dangerous. They were already inside the building and were surprised by a man who was knocked down by a guard doll. At the same time, Machin arrives there and tries to fight the doll. However, even though she had managed to knock him down, the puppet could still get up and put up a fight. Seeing Orphan's presence there, the doll seemed to know that he was a witch and instead rushed to run away with the man who had been one of its victims. Seeing one of her henchmen being carried away by the guardian puppet, Machin rushed after him, where she then engaged in a fierce fight against the puppet. She managed to slash the doll's stomach. But the doll uses a magic spell that can transfer the wound it suffered to the man who was held captive by it. The doll suddenly disappeared when Machin was about to launch another attack while her subordinate fell into a secret room behind the man. Orphan then tells her that one of her subordinates has asked for his help to save her. However, with the wolf pack of monsters surrounding the place, they certainly wouldn't be able to escape easily. But before that, Orphan asked Machin about her purpose in visiting the place. Unfortunately, she doesn't want to tell him about it, because they've just met. Seeing her annoying attitude, Cleom said they shouldn't have bothered to come and immediately continued to Kimluck. Knowing that Orphan and his companions were about to head to Kimluck, Madchen offered to be their guide because she was from Kimluck. And in return, she asks them to help her find her subordinate who fell down there first. After reaching an agreement, they finally descended the hole using a rope. Arriving at the bottom of the hole, Madchen finally found her subordinate, who had died. 
Orphan then asks Machin about the history of the Kamasunda Theater, who tells them that it was founded 200 years ago to show the play The Demon King. One day, a king who reigns in the human world is invited to watch the play. However, after watching the performance of The Demon King, the king ordered the theater to be demolished. When Machin was about to continue discussing the history of the theater, Magic suddenly intervened, so they chose to explore the underground area to find a way out of the place. However, as they went deeper into the area, Magic suddenly fell, and Cleom fell silent. Orphan immediately realized that it was all the work of the guardian puppet, so he then used his magic power and tried to find out where the doll was hiding. Not long after, the doll finally appeared and began to launch attacks on them, followed by the appearance of other dolls from the dark side. When one of the dolls was about to cast a spell on Cleom, Orphan immediately rushed to save her. But then, Cleom, Machin, and Magic suddenly disappeared after the doll performed teleportation magic to transport them to another place. One of the dolls then asked Orphan about his purpose in coming to the Kamasunda Theater, which he said, he wanted to find out the truth about angels and demons. Orphan, who did not understand the meaning of their words, then prepared to launch an attack. However, the dolls disappeared just like that, so he became annoyed and continued his journey to find his friends until finally, he met Magic, who had been enchanted. After freeing Magic from the magic spell, the puppets finally appear and tell Orphan that the Demon King has ordered them to take Magic's life because he is deemed unfit to know the truth about angels and demons. At the same time, Orphan realized that they were not only surrounded by the magic puppets but also the pack of wolf monsters that had filled the place. Orphan, one of the most talented witches in the Tower of Fawns, then uses his strongest magic power to destroy the magic dolls and the wolf monsters at once. Suddenly, one of the magic dolls came up to him and threatened Orphan to stop his attack by showing Machin's body frozen with ice magic. Surprisingly, Cleom suddenly appeared and managed to free Machin's body which was trapped in the ice, after slashing the doll's body. She tells Orphan that she manages to escape from the magic dolls because of Lakey's power. When the magic doll was about to rise again and prepare to attack them, she rushed to throw Machin's sword at the doll and destroyed it. However, the battle didn't stop there, as the magic puppets returned and prepared to launch an attack on them. Machin, who had woken up, then stuck her sword into the ground to create the magical barrier that could protect them, while Orphan used one of his strongest techniques that he had learned from his master, Childman, to destroy all the magic dolls, and also tore down buildings. After all the magic dolls have been destroyed, suddenly, a magic doll introduces himself as Swadenborg's magic doll, who tells Orphan that he has been deemed worthy of gaining knowledge about angels and demons. Swadenborg then informed that Kamasunda Theater was founded by one of the dragons named Nornir to warn witches because later, all magic power would disappear from this earth. After that, the doll showed Orphan about the Demon King's drama performance, which turned out to be a glimpse of the past of the Demon King Swadenborg, who was met by a goddess who intended to borrow the powers of angels and demons controlled by Swadenborg. The goddess aims to use this power to eliminate all the magic power that has been stolen because, according to her, magic can disrupt the balance of the world. Orphan apparently recognized the figure of the goddess, one of the three goddesses of fate, nicknamed the Weird Sisters, who were worshipped by the people of the Kimlock Church. The theater collapsed again shortly after, so Orphan rushed to protect his friends. After the Kamasunda theater has been completely destroyed, he finds a letter from Azeli, which hints that she's the one who protects them. After that, Machin continued her story about the Kamasunda theater, which was not destroyed even though the king had ordered it. At that time, members of the royal family ordered the Kimluck Church to destroy the Kamasunda Theater, but instead, they lied and reported that the theater had been destroyed. Machin revealed that she had been sent by someone to investigate Kamasunda Theater. She also revealed that she is the death instructor of Kimluck Church. Upon knowing that, Orphan asked why Machin helped him infiltrate Kimluck, even though the death instructor's job was to kill witches like himself. She informed him that she never sided with the leader of Kimluck Church and became the death instructor to stay in Kimluck. The scene then switches and shows a man named Kuo, who is meeting the leader of the Kimluck Church, Pope Ram Anirak, and informs him of the right time to eradicate the witches because Childman, who they consider the strongest witch, has died. However, Ram Anirak said they did not need to do that because when the time came, all human witches would be wiped off this earth. Kuo reported about a traitor in Kimluck Church, but Ram Anirak didn't seem to care much about it. Elsewhere, Orphan is rethinking flashes of the past that Swadenborg's doll has shown. Not long after, Magic arrived there and asked Orphan to teach him magic before they left for Kimluck. Meanwhile, Machin is seen talking to an old man who asks about her goal of working with a witch like Orphan. The man seemed to know that she was the death instructor, who was Kuo's subordinate. Because of that, he warned her about Kuo, whose strength cannot be underestimated. Moreover, Kuo also has two pretty formidable bodyguards named Carlotta and Nami. However, Machin is determined to continue to fight against Kimluck Church because the church officials live in luxury with the rich. 
In contrast, the common people live in poverty and are full of suffering. Machin said that Pope Ramonirak did not know about the condition of the commoners, so she was determined to meet Ramonirak and tell him about everything. After that, she came out of the room and asked Orphan to meet the old man, who then introduced himself as Olaf. Olaf then reveals to Orphan that he is a former death instructor. Orphan apparently already knew this. Even he also knew that Machin and Olaf were planning to kill Kuo. Even though Olaf had warned Orphan that killing Kuo was not an easy matter and that he would have to risk his own life, he turned out to have prepared himself and was determined to keep going to Kimluk and not care about the risk. The scene then switches and shows Salua, still alive and locked up in the underground prison at Kimluk Church. The next day, Orphan and Machin rush to Kimluk by horse-drawn carriage. Machin then asks why he didn't bring Cleom and Magic to go with them to Kimluk. He frankly said he didn't trust her completely and thought his comrades would be in danger if she betrayed him. Orphan then asked about the number of death instructors currently in Kimluk and their duties other than hunting down witches. Machin said that at this time, the death instructors were at least six people and their task, besides hunting down witches, was to kill their former comrades who had betrayed. Afterward, they finally arrived at the city gate, where the great wall called the Wall Instruction separates the inside and outside of the city of Kimluk. Not long after, the horse carriage they were riding was blocked by several residents who wanted to enter the inner city of Kimluk called the Holy City. However, Machin refused their request because only people from certain circles could enter the holy city. Suddenly, a bald man jealous of Orphan for being able to enter the holy city attacked him, causing a dispute in that place. During the commotion that was going on, Cleom suddenly appeared and revealed that all this time, she had been hiding in a wooden box on a carriage, as well as Magic. She said that she and Magic won't let Orphan go alone because they will help him if he gets into trouble. She didn't even hesitate to show Lakey in front of everyone. Unfortunately, Lakey accidentally activates his magic power, so Kuo can notice the existence of the witches in Kimluk. Kuo then ordered Name to check the situation outside the holy city. Meanwhile, Orphan finally wakes up after being unconscious for quite a while when Lakey accidentally releases his magic power. Seeing the bald man who had attacked him earlier, he immediately approached the man and intended to hit him for causing such a mess. However, Cleom defended the bald man by saying that it was the man who had helped them to hide from the death instructors who had come to check on the situation. The bald man then introduces himself as Lainote and reveals that he is a witch who infiltrated Kimluk to conduct an investigation on orders from the kingdom. Afterward, Cleom told Orphan that Machin suddenly disappeared during the explosion, and so far, they have not found her whereabouts. Elsewhere, Azalea and the two dwarves were already seen in Kimluk and resting at an inn. She puts the two dwarves to sleep and reads Swattenborg's History of Magic books which mentions that the Weird Sisters launched an attack on the dragons who had stolen the magic belonging to the gods. Because of the attack, the dragons fled to a continent called Kisalhima, which turned out to be the human world, creating the magical barrier. However, as time passed, the magical barrier gradually began to crack and weaken the dragons' defenses, so the Weird Sisters then sent hordes of monsters to attack the dragons. However, the herd of monsters turned out to be not strong enough to defeat the dragons, so one of the weird sisters, the goddess Velzendi, came down directly to face the dragons, resulting in a great battle known as the Battle of Ragnarok Fortress. In the end, Velzendi could be defeated, and the crack in the magical barrier could be closed again, or so it was written in the history books. And Azalee seemed to know about something, so she then burned the history book for not writing the true story. The scene then switches and shows Orphan and his comrades plan to infiltrate the holy city. Leno took the initiative to take them to a secret path that was in an inn. But then, they are confronted by a group of men who hate witches even though they are not part of the Kimluk Church. They turned out to have suspected that Orphan was a witch and intended to capture him. Leno defends Orphan by saying that he is Machin's bodyguard, whom they know as the Death Instructor. Orphan proves his ability in physical combat, which can easily defeat the men. Afterward, the male innkeeper escorted them to a well that became a secret path to the Holy City. Shortly afterward, Leno descended first to the bottom of the well, followed by Cleom and Magic. Before following them, Orphan received a warning from the male innkeeper to always be wary of Leno because he never trusted Leno. Finally, they arrived at the bottom of the well, which turned out to be a long tunnel that ended in the holy city. On the way, Leno suddenly fell, and Orphan then realized that the bald man had secretly left a mark on the floor. Leno warned that it was raining heavily outside and asked them to be careful because overflowing rainwater could flood the tunnel. Sure enough, not long after, a flood of water flooded the tunnel and hit so fast, causing them to scatter. After the flood receded, Orphan looked for his comrades and finally met Leno, who revealed that he was actually Name, one of the death instructors who was Kuo's henchman. Name reveals that the male innkeeper had been killed by the guards, who finally arrived after following the trail he left. Shortly afterward, Orphan was involved in a fierce battle against Name and the guards until he finally managed to knock them out and ran away. 
Young Magic, who was seen carrying Cleom, that had fainted because she had been carried away by a strong current. He tries to summon Orphan, but his screams reveal his whereabouts, so the guards can easily find them. Back to Orphan, who could not avoid the pursuit of Name, and a fierce battle ensues between them. Unfortunately, he soon gets into trouble when Name demonstrates his extremely formidable physical abilities, where he gains this ability after taking a drug that can drastically increase a person's physical strength. However, the drug had a side effect that made Name look like an old man, even though he was only 17. Orphan immediately became overwhelmed because he could not use his magic power, which could cause the tunnel to collapse. However, this was not the case with Magic, who did not hesitate to use magic power to bring down the guards about to attack him. Suddenly, Name became hysterical and revealed that he was very jealous of witches and had ambitions to become a witch. Even so, he is completely incapable of using magical powers, so he becomes very resentful of witches who he thinks do not deserve to live in this world. Hearing this, Orphan became very angry and then hit Name, killing him. Orphan seemed devastated by Name's death because he shouldn't have killed a human who didn't have magical powers. Not long after, Orphan noticed a slip of paper fell from his pocket, along with the appearance of Magic carrying Cleon because she was still unconscious. Magic looks shocked when he finds that Orphan has killed Name, who is just an ordinary human, but Orphan insists that Name wants to kill him, and he loses control, so Orphan is forced to kill him. Magic tried to approach Orphan to treat his wounds, but he got irritated instead and was rude to Magic. Soon after, they got into a heated argument, until finally, Magic relented and asked him to check on Cleom who had been unconscious for a long time. When he was about to use his magic power to heal her, Orphan experienced something strange in his body, where he didn't even remember Cleom and Magic until he finally passed out. In his sleep, Orphan remembered flashes from the past about the two dwarves, his memories with Azalee and Letitia, and their friends in the Tower of Fongs when they were still studying magic there. Not long after, he finally woke up and realized that he was being dragged by Magic. As he was about to hit Magic for being so presumptuous of him, Orphan finally remembered him and Cleon. Orphan realized that Magic had treated him and praised his ability because he could perform healing magic. After that, Orphan opened the paper that had fallen from his pocket, which was tucked in by the man who owned the inn before he descended the well. The paper turned out to be a map, which he thought was a map of the tunnel they were currently in. Orphan and Magic seemed too focused on studying the map, so they just realized that Cleom and Lakey had disappeared somewhere. The scene then switches and shows Machin, who managed to infiltrate Carlotta's room, pointing her sword at her while asking where Salua was. However, Carlotta apparently had anticipated her arrival and managed to cut her hand with a knife she had prepared. Knowing that the guards were starting to arrive, Machin rushed out of Carlotta's room. On the other hand, Orphan and Magic noticed other footprints around them and decided to follow the footprints, which turned out to be Cleon's. When Oprin and Magic caught up with Cleon, they realized that she was walking in a state of unconsciousness, and her body was being controlled by Lakey. Orphan thought that Lakey might be annoyed with them because he never treated her, so Lakey decided to find someone else who could treat her. Shortly afterward, Orphan and Magic followed Lakey, who brought Cleon to a room filled with human skeletons that seemed to have been thrown there like trash. After that, Lakey used teleportation magic to take her out through the hole in the room. Magic tried to catch up with them but failed to use teleportation magic and fell instead. At the same time, Orphan could not use his magic power because he was still haunted by the image of Name's terrifying face that filled his mind. Orphan and Magic then climbed the wall in the room and managed to climb to the top floor, which turned out to be the Kimluck Church dungeon. They then tried to find the whereabouts of the awakened Cleon, who was in a holding cell of an inmate who was none other than Salua. Orphan was very surprised because Salua was even thrown into prison, even though that man was the death instructor. Not even having time to listen to his explanation, suddenly, the guards appeared and immediately attacked them. Orphan tried to use his magic power to knock them down, but he was reminded again of Name that filled his mind, making his head hurt until finally, he collapsed unconscious. When he finally wakes up, Orphan realizes they have succeeded in bringing down the guards, and Magic informs them that they have Lakey's help. Knowing that Orphan is currently unable to use magic, Salua suggests that they immediately flee from that place and head to the house of his older brother, Lapoint. However, in the middle of the journey, Orphan was still haunted by the terrible figure of Name, which seemed to grip tightly in his mind until finally making him collapse again unconscious. Magic and the others were forced to pause their journey and wait for Orphan to wake up again. Not long after, Orphan finally came to his senses, and they continued their journey. Finally, they arrived at a magnificent hall. They were suddenly surprised by the presence of the guards who seemed to have been waiting for their arrival. It didn't stop there. The guards were even led directly by Kuo, who had the ambition to eradicate witches from the earth. Cleom then took the initiative to attack first and intended to use Lakey's magic power. 
However, Orphan stopped her and warned that the attack would only bring down the Kimluk Church and harm them all. After that, Kuo makes Salua bounce because he feels angry at Salua and Machin, who has devised a plan to kill him. Salua then gets up and reveals his reason for wanting to kill Kuo because he always fights witches and doesn't hesitate to kill people who come from outside Kimluk, even though those people are not witches. Upon hearing that, Kuo again launched an attack on Salua. Fortunately, he managed to dodge it, so Kuo ordered the guards to attack them. Soon afterward, Majit tried to attack Kuo with his magic power, but he was blown away because his attacks didn't work against Kuo. Salua then tells that Kuo is currently wearing the demon armor that can ward off all magic attacks. Because of that, Salua decided to fight Kuo using his physical strength, as well as Orphan, who fought the guards by relying on his physical strength. Orphan managed to bring down the guards until finally, one guard was left, none other than Azili. After revealing her identity, Azili returned Orphan's clothes with her magic and plunged Baltander's sword into the ground, creating several tall pillars to stop the guards' attacks. She suggested that they leave immediately to save Magic. But at the same time, Salua was defeated by Kuo, so Orphan decided to stay there and fight him and ask them to go and save Magic. However, Cleom insisted on helping Orphan and attack Kuo with Lakey's power. She tried to destroy the wall to find a way out of the room, but she was blown away by Kuo's attack. Afterward, Kuo attacks Orphan with his sword, which can launch attacks from a distance, revealing that Name is his son. Because Kuo mentioned Name, Orphan was reminded of his figure and almost collapsed unconscious if Azili didn't come in time to resuscitate him. Afterward, Azili launched an attack on Kuo, even though she already knew that her magic power would not work against him. However, she was not after Kuo but a door behind him, which revealed the figure of a woman who was being strangled by a hand emerging from the hole. Seeing this, Orphan tried to approach the woman to check her condition, but Kuo shot him from behind, causing him to fall into the water behind the door. After Orphan was sunk, Azili asked Cleon to take Magic and Salua away by performing teleportation magic through a magic artifact. On the other hand, Kuo did something surprising by killing the guards who had seen the woman's strangled body, while Azili then used flying magic and rushed to save Orphan. After Azili entered the water, Kuo looked at the woman who was being strangled, who turned out to be Oriole, and told her that she was the stupidest woman ever living in this world. Not long after, La Pointe, who is Salua's older brother, arrives there, revealing that La Pointe has been the death instructor who sided with Kuo all this time. Apart from La Pointe, Carlotta also shows up and reports about Madchen breaking into his room last night. Kuo didn't tell him about Orphan and Azili being in the water and instead ordered the death instructors to catch Salua, who had escaped from prison. Kuo told La Pointe to kill Salua immediately if he came to his house and asked him for help. Before leaving, Carlotta tells him Pope Ramanirak asked Kuo to come to see him. Meanwhile, Cleom and the others apparently teleported to the two dwarves' room, which was previously arranged by Azeli. However, because the two dwarves were too chatty, Cleom asked Lakey to move them to the Kimluk Church's crypt. After recovering, Salua took Cleom and Majit to his older brother's house, where La Pointe was already waiting for them with his sword drawn. La Point, knowing that Magic was a witch, then asked why a witch like him dared to set foot in the house of a death instructor. He firmly said that he needed La Point's help to save Orphan, who was still in the basement of the Kimluk Church. Upon hearing that, La Point was surprised because Kuo had never mentioned the presence of witches in the Kimluk Church's crypt before. Salua then told his brother that Kuo had other goals and often acted alone without Ramanirak knowing, so he and Machin decided to rebel against Kuo. La Pointe seemed to be starting to believe his brother's words and told them to enter a room where Machin had been waiting for them to discuss their next plans. Meanwhile, Orphan, unconscious underwater, communicates with Oriole's spirit in his subconscious. Oriole, the founder of the Witch of the Heavenly Beings, then tells about the war between the dragons and the gods 300 years ago. Meanwhile, Carlotta came to La Pointe's house elsewhere because she had already guessed that Salua must be there. La Pointe then tells her about Kuo lying to them about the presence of witches in the Kimluk Church's crypt. However, she didn't seem to care, then she drew her sword instead and killed La Pointe. After that, Carlotta and her henchmen then threw La Pointe's body into the dungeon where Salua and the others were choosing weapons to use in battle. Elsewhere, Kuo meets Ramanirak, who had just killed a maid just because she had seen his true face. Since Kuo had also seen his true face, Ramanirak tried to finish him. However, Kuo then fought back and managed to reveal the cloak covering Ramanirak, revealing that Ramanirak had a shape like the magic doll in the Kamasunda Theater. The magic doll then reveals that he is actually Ermankar, the founder of the witching people of the human race. The scene then switches and shows Azeli, who managed to save Orphan. However, Azeli soon ran out of energy because she used all her magic power to heal Orphan's gunshot wound until finally, she collapsed unconscious. 
Orphan finally woke up and looked at Oriole, where he realized that the hand strangling the woman was the hand of Velzemi, one of the weird sisters assigned to attack the dragons. Not long after, Azeli then woke up and told Orphan that he couldn't use his magic because he still harbored feelings of guilt for killing an ordinary human who did not have magical powers. He didn't deny that and blamed himself because he should have used power to kill the white sorcerers like Azeli. He said he was determined to bring her back together with himself and Letitia, but Azeli refused and said that she had murdered Childman and felt so responsible for it that she could not return to her friends. After Azeli took out Baltander's sword to give to Orphan, Kuo appeared there with Ramonirak and immediately attacked them. Orphan seemed surprised that Ramonirak had the power of the white sorcerers like Azeli, even though he was a magic puppet made by Nornir. Ramonirak reveals that he was not made by Nornir but that Nornir made the magic dolls look like him. Ramonirak tells about the great battle between the dragons and the gods, at which time the dragons became desperate and ordered Oriole to fight one of the goddesses assigned to lead the attack, named Velzendi. One hundred years ago, when Ramonirak was still in human form, he conducted an investigation into the Ragnarok fortress and accidentally met Velzendi, who then made him have magical powers and become the first witch of the human race. Velzendi intended to kill Ramonirak right then and there, but Oriole arrived just in time and saved him, although, in the end, Oriole had to end up suffocating like this. Ramonirak soon realized that Velzendi and the gods hated anyone who studied magic other than them, and had ambitions to destroy other nations who mastered magic, including humans. However, Velzendi and the gods could not enter the human world due to being blocked by Oriole's body. Ramonirak knew that sooner or later, Velzendi and the gods would be able to enter the human world through the gap and would not hesitate to destroy a world that was already filled with people capable of using magical powers. That's why Ramonirak founded the Kimluk Church to kill the witches of the human race so that the gods would not destroy their world. After eliminating all witches from the human race, Ramonirak was destined to die at the hands of Childman, who turned out to be a heavenly being because he was the son of Istersiva, who was also a heavenly being. Ramonirak says that Childman is the only person who can kill him because he has an immortal body. Turning to the present, Orphan then tells Ramonirak that Childman has died. Their conversation was interrupted when Kuo suddenly attacked Azeli indiscriminately, rendering her helpless. Orphan, who saw his friend being hurt like that, did not stay silent and tried to fight back. However, he could not use his magic power until finally, the two dwarves appeared, making him angry because he remembered the pranks they had done. Suddenly, Orphan attacked the two dwarves which simultaneously sent Ramonirak flying into the water. Orphan, who was finally able to use his magic power again, was involved in a fierce battle against Kuo. However, with his demonic armor, Kuo can avoid his attacks. Kuo later revealed that he was annoyed with Ramonirak, who he thought was a hypocritical witch. When Orphan was about to put up a fight, Carlotta arrived there, taking Cleom and the others as hostages. But then, Carlotta kills the guards and frees them because she turns out to be on Ramonirak's side and has ambitions to replace Kuo as Ramonirak's confidant. After that, Salua also took the opportunity to attack Kuo, while Azeli and Orphan tried to slash the demonic armor to kill Kuo. Knowing that he was in a desperate situation, Kuo, who sided with the gods and had ambitions to destroy the human witches, stabbed Oriole in the head to make way for Velzendi so that the goddess could enter the human world and kill all witches. Velzendi tried to enter the human world through the gap, but Oriole used all her strength to restrain the goddess's body. Realizing that Oriole's strength will not be enough to hold the goddess, Azili tells Orphan that the white magic can help her. However, it required more than just casting a certain spell because to close the gap between the two worlds, at least it takes a very large white magic. Orphan immediately realized that Azili intended to sacrifice herself and used her white magic to close the gap. He refused her wish because he didn't want to lose her. Orphan also realizes that Childman chose himself as the successor because he hopes Orphan can prevent Azeli, who intends to sacrifice himself to prevent Velzendi and the gods from destroying the human world. However, Azeli was determined to sacrifice herself. In fact, she did plan to kill Childman, knowing that he would do anything to prevent her from sacrificing for the safety of mankind. She then ended her life by using the sword Baltanders. Azeli, who had turned into a spirit form filled with the white magic, then reunited the open gap until finally the gap completely closed and disappeared with Oriole and Velzendi. Seeing this, Kuo then said that this time they might succeed in preventing Velzendi and the gods from entering the human world and destroying the witches. However, someday, another loophole will definitely open up. When that happens, they can't go against fate if all the witches of the human race are annihilated. After that incident, Carlotta was finally appointed as Ramonirak's confidant, who was still alive and still carrying out his role as the leader of Kimluk Church. Meanwhile, Salua and Machin decide to leave Kimluk and go wandering because they are now considered traitors. The moral that can be learned from this anime is that never take another person's life, whatever the reason is. 
because these actions not only violate the law but can make us very burdened, both mentally and morally. Besides that, we are also taught the importance of making sacrifices to save those we love, even though, at first, it was strongly opposed by those who did not want to lose us forever.